We are ready for your questions. Jason is ready. The mic is right there. If you can get up and go to that mic, that would be fantastic. Did you guys have a good time tonight? Yeah? Good, good. I'm really happy to hear that. All right, first Hi. question. Hi, Jason. Thanks for coming out here. It's great to see you speak again. Um, I really wanted to talk about the VR theater idea that you had. Um, the so what? The what? VR? VR and theater. The VR and theater. Oh, yeah, cool. Theatrical performances and virtual reality. I was wondering if you could expand upon that. Sure. Um, have you ever read a book called Hamlet on the Holodeck? Hamlet and the Holodeck. No? Okay. So Janet Murray wrote this book, The Holodeck from Star Trek. You know that room where you go and it's a... So Hamlet and the Holodeck is a book about immersion, mm. which is the, the word that we use to describe that magical feeling when you assume the mediated reality. So it's, you know, you go to a theater and you're, you're kind of restless, like when is this going to start? And, you know, and then you're like, you have to pee and... You know, it starts and you're still thinking about work and whatever. And then, like, if it's good, right? If the acting is good, if the thing of music is good, if whatever is good, if you didn't eat too much, you're not too full, you know, whatever. All of a sudden, like, all that other shit you were worried about is gone. And now you're, like, fully fucking invested in the narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Like, as far as I'm concerned, that's the holy grail of media when it immerses you fully. And the better the media, the more satiating and satisfying the immersion. So... Now, we, you know, it already exists to a certain degree. A good movie is brilliantly immersive. A good play is brilliantly immersive because we can broadcast our mind from the seat into the screen or into the stage. Now, what uh, immersive theater, this new genre of theater is trying to do, is get you out of the seat and m embodied in the world. So it's the next step. All of a sudden, you have agency. You can move around. You can interact with the characters. The characters' actions can change when they interact with you. The most famous example of immersive theater is in New York City, Sleep No More. Oh, okay. yeah. Punch Drunk is the British company that did this. And as far as I'm concerned, like, they cracked it. You know, the virtual reality dream of like, being in the movie where you can move around, they did with analog theater. So, I mean, this is a, a, some kind of hybrid of like Hitchcock and Macbeth, and it takes place in an abandoned hotel, and it's seven floors, and you go in wearing a mask. Yeah. That's what like distinguishes you from the actors. So all the audience is wearing these like eyes wide shut style masks, and the whole thing is super eerie. The stage design and the lighting and the music is magnificent. You're hurled into the world, and then the actors that are sort of dance performing a version of Macbeth all over the hotel, but you never know from where and how or when. So you're just lost in this world, and occasionally pieces of performance, you stumble into pieces of performance while exploring, and then you can follow the actors around or you cannot. But the feeling is very much like being in a lucid dream, you know? I can't wait. Yeah, and so the idea being that eventually this kind of immersive theater where the audience has participation and agency will be combined with things like augmented or mixed reality interfaces, okay. where you can wear like some kind of, you know, maybe the, the, those lenses that came out that can put digital artifacts yep. and add elements to that. Um, and then there's also the idea of like fully immersive virtual reality where you're sitting in a chair or you're on a treadmill and you can walk around some kind of a world. But I think that has a ways to go before it can be as dynamic as the analog version. Oh, awesome. Awesome. You just grab the mic and move it up towards you. Like, get the stand. Yeah, perfect. Just like that. Thank you. Hey, Jason. Hey, man. I, um, well, I'd say... Well, the first thing I'd like to ask is, I thought this was going to be where you were going to chronologically show your shots of all, and we're going to get to view it, which is not the case. So, as a fan, will you be willing to do a shot of like to freestyle something like that in front of us, like in real time? Because <laughs> that's we came to see Neo. We want to see that person. The other thing I wanted to say is, in the field of electronic music, you can go anywhere in the universe, and as you, as a futurist. Have you ever thought of maybe doing a narrative to guided meditation or thinkitation so that we can view some type of meditation in your world where we go into an altered state with maybe binaural beats that slow our brain waves or put us in an altered that state so and we awesome. hear you? Because yeah. it would be a waste for you to never do that. I hear you, man. Um, thanks for your question. Yeah, uh, this was a little bit different because the format here was just fireside chat. I, I have done anyway. these events. Typically, I do uh, like a 25 minute talk in combination with the videos, um, which is great because it introduces the work 
to people and it uh, gives examples of what I'm talking about. Um, we didn't do that this time around, but uh, I, I mean, hopefully the conversation, because it was unscripted, gave you a, a sense of, of that freestyle. <laughs> I'm shots, a fan. I heard, I heard, of it, I heard it all. <laughs> but I loved it uh, to be here with you. It's just amazing. Great, That's why I came well, thanks, thanks for coming. And as far as like recording something that we could, you know, like, a, you know, nobody's ever done that. I mean, a few people have uh, where they take snippets from either podcast interviews or some of my videos and they mix it with electronic music. Um, there's a couple of DJs that have sent me sets where they use my voice. Super cool. Uh, yeah. I've never done it deliberately in partnership with somebody, but it would certainly be interesting to do. Yeah, I mean, as far as like in the field of electronic music, I know the best. And if you ever wanted to, or mm -hmm. not, you know, you have to collaborate with me. I'd love to, I'm man. You actually writing a narrative and saying, "This is what I'm going to do," and we're going to put some music to it. And well, I mean, like I have plenty of stuff that uh, that is audio without any post-production that I could give you. I mean, you that would be something. amazing. Yeah, man. dude. And then we can send it to everybody that came here and they'll know that we came out of this. Yeah. yeah. And my name is Rocco Anthony Fermisco, and I asked you one time, what is enlightenment to you? I don't know if you remembered, but maybe you could tell us what that. What is what? Well, what is enlightenment to you? Because hmm. you said you weren't enlightened, but you had these classical mystical states and you didn't think they could be, you know, just sustained like the Buddha talks. Yeah. You know what it is? Um, I've had profoundly um, moving and, and aesthetically relevant experiences that have shifted me, that have seemingly transformed me, that have inspired my work and my career, which in turn has inspired others. So clearly there's a, a digital paper trail that shows where I've been. I mean, my, my videos might as well be referred to as trip reports, for sure. Um, <laughs> however, I think I'm so terrified of being disappointed that I don't cling to the revealed truths of my videos too strongly. I have the experience, I make a video about it, and then typically I... I kind of go back into my baseline of openness, but also uh, I avoid drinking my own Kool-Aid. Yeah. And, and I think the reason for that is because there's the terror that I'm like, what if I have one, one of these moments feels like, oh, now I understand how life is. I had a mystical experience and I'm one with everything and everything is perfect. Yeah, and then my friend tells me that his mother had a tumor on her kidney. How am I supposed to like... How's that compatible with a mystical universal union that I had the day before? You know, so it's like, it's like I see the homeless people in San Francisco and then I'm just like so much suffering on the street and we ignore it. And it's like, okay, yesterday I was listening to a beautiful song, feel one with the universe, and now I see people suffering on the street. It kind of negates the oneness I had with the universe the day before. And so that's why, you know, my enlightenment always feels short-lived. Mm -hmm. So far. Oh, so far, yeah. <laughs> So, but uh, it keeps me humble, right? Because a lot of people who are enlightened become overzealous, self-righteous gurus, you know, and I selling false truth, you know. And I, I, I think it's more human to admit that we're full of holes and we have moments of clarity and insight and moments of confusion and doubt. Thank you. I won't, I won't keep these people waiting, but yeah. Um, Thanks, bro. How do I collaborate with you? Do I just email, email me through my website. I'm really okay. good like that. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Thanks. bro. Appreciate it. Thanks. So I love to put myself on the edge, so I forced myself to do something that I uh, usually would, which is come up with a question days before. Awesome. Um, and through those past two questions, it kind of cultivated uh, a new culture within me to ask this one, which is it kind of seems like the narrative through all of these uh, talks and whatnot is solving that kind of existential angst that we're collectively having after we solve this uh, humanistic need and in getting into the frontier of existentialism and what comes next. Uh, so really it kind of sounds like this narrative of the singularity and whatnot is going towards just building more of the same, uh, the same bubble almost. So when does it get to the, where is the point at which, uh, I mean, it's kind of like 
almost the way that I see it is building upon building the 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 mind. Um, but what's beyond that? Are we just going to become slaves to the mind of building connections upon connections until we become the universe? Or is there something more? I... <laughs> I'm not, I'm not I'm not sure what comes next man to be honest I uh you know I think well Kurzweil certainly thinks the father of the singularity that we will infuse all matter with intelligence so at that point right now the kind of intelligence that we recognize seems to be housed in this amazing 3 pound flesh computer called the brain but if we could in, infuse intelligence into everything, then it's, you know, Kurzweil says the universe will wake up. Um, certainly the beginnings of this right now, we call it the Internet of Things, is a version of extending, exteriorizing our minds by infusing everyday objects with feedback and with intuition and with artificial intelligence and creating a world where a lot of the boundaries between ourselves and the world start to disintegrate because we're increasingly going to live in a world that responds to us and that can predict our needs and that can offer us a drink when we're thirsty. And so when the world starts to have as much agency as a highly advanced version of Siri, it's already going to start to feel like we're living in a world that lets like a return to animism, like indigenous cultures would talk to trees and talk to stones. You know, It's going to be digitally mediated animism. The world will sort of come alive. And at some point when the level and sophistication of the feedback we get from everyday objects, you know, and even in the short term, is of a fidelity that's high enough for us to respond to it, and it responds to us intuitively, we'll stop asking the question of whether it really has consciousness, just like we stop asking that question of each other. Because I don't know if any of you guys are fully conscious, and you don't know if I am. I could just be a zombie that's pretending to be conscious. Same goes for you guys. But at some point, we just suspend disbelief. We just accept the fact that a person is conscious based on the intuition of the feedback loops we get from that person. Um, and so I think that's kind of what will happen. Like, we'll impregnate more and more of the world with, with mind, mm. is I think that it's kind of where we're heading if you kind of map our technological trajectory. Now, whether what that means metaphysically is up to the poets and the artists, you know? As a poet, thank you. Um, and yeah, that, that fits in right with the idea of. Uh, we are a prisoner to every prisoner we hold in prison because there has to be a guard for every prisoner. So as we allow the world to be more conscious, then we ourselves will have more consciousness to experience in the world. Thank you. I hope so. Thank you, bro. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Asher. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Hey, man. It was amazing. Oh, um, thanks. Yeah, it's... Uh, I love the way you talk about Fermi's paradox, and I'm like really interested about paradoxes. Cool. Like I made this video uh, in college, and it was about me meditating and like self actualization and realization of my true self. But the funny thing was, is like I didn't even meditate really back in college. But then now I meditate all the time, and so I realize like, oh my god, this is like what I was working towards was this like amazing space and time where I could become like you know this singular meditation. So I'm wondering like, how do yeah. you grapple with paradox? And like, how do you make sense of that paradox? Like, are we, you know, I, we I oscillate between the, the the two things that are in conflict. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, how, you know, for me, it's paradoxical in a way that that you know we, for or even like you know we feel conscious, and yet we're told by neuroscientists that the self is an illusion. You know, there's there's kinds of paradoxes that we grapple with every day. We feel, you know, at least young people feel immortal yet we're told that we are mortal. Like, we, we, we live in doubt. You know, science has done a really good job of explaining the world, but then there's new things that emerge that call into question everything we thought we knew. Um, so we're constantly thrown into situations where we have to um, live with two seemingly contradictory ideas and somehow live in the presence of both. Um, it's tricky, but we do it. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, bro. Actually, that's one of the hallmarks of a mystical experience is paradoxicality, a feeling that the two seemingly opposing things suddenly fit in a larger model of reality that you're privy to. Yeah. Cheers.
Hi, my name is Jade Natanya Ullman. I work for MAPS, Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. So first of all, thank you so You're much. You're with MAPS? Woo! Yes. Rock and roll. <laughs> Yay, MAPS. Thank you people in the room who are all here supporting you. Say hi so to Rick. I'm thankful for what you do. <laughs> and I don't know if you've been following, but there's been a lot of challenges in the community around the future of psychedelic medicine. There's approaches that MAPS is doing in the nonprofit approach. Um, and then there's for-profit approaches, and I was just wondering if you have any wisdom on how we can do this work in a way that's conscious and changing society and, and aware of sort of the, the social structures that we live in, since you have such wisdom. Yeah, I mean, what, I, what I've read in Michael Pollan's book is the, the concern about the medicalization of psychedelics. So, yes, these controls that we're putting in now with these studies are important because we can't afford to risk what happened in the 60s when the exuberance got so out of control that we pissed off the wrong people and it, the research was halted. So I think the, the, the careful approach that they're taking now is good. And the baby steps are similar to what happened with cannabis. At first it's medical, but then eventually we got to recreational. I think we can kind of follow a similar model. You know, it's harder for the powers that be to say, no, we're not going to let you use this even though it's helping people with treatment to, to resistant depression and anxiety. And so the medicalization approach, I think, is a great first step. But what about the idea of making well people better? I mean, aren't we all, in a way, having like micro PTSD? <laughs> Don't we all suffer from at least a little bit of depression and anxiety? I mean, for some it becomes pathological when they can no longer function and hold down a job and so on and so forth. But... I think the rest of us are just better at hiding it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so, I mean, look what happened to here when super successful, achieved people kill themselves all of a sudden. I mean, what does that tell you about the seemingly well-adjusted and successful? So, but I think the medicalization approach is a good first st step. And I think eventually it's going to be more like, you know, like going to like a, like a spa. It'll be like a place that is licensed with licensed psychotherapists, and but then aesthetically they can be whatever you, you're into. You know, it can be like a jungle spa, psychedelic wellness spa, and there can be like a singularity futurist psychedelic spa, a cosmological psychedelic spa. You know, because one of the things that we've learned about these medicines is that, is that the, their effects are 100% constructed by set and setting and expectation. So, you know, if you're... Uh, interpretive frameworks are of one culture, indigenous culture, then the divine will present itself to you in a particular wallpaper. And if you're a Christian, you know, it'll present itself in the form of Jesus. And if you're an uh, engineer, it'll present itself in the form of a solution to an engineering problem. And so I think it'll be maybe the psychedelic spas of the future, which will be, will be like restaurants where you pick your cuisine. You know, but they'll all be uh, regulated, just like restaurant food quality will be regu regulated, and and the cooks will have to be clean and regulated. You know, like I think maybe that's the answer in the future. You know. Thank you for your support in helping make that happen. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's uh the future. The mind is ripe for exploration, and so you know if we can help alleviate human suffering and learn a little bit more about consciousness and treat these things as tools, then you know. It's a tool. And if used in the right way, it can solve a problem. And if used in the wrong way, it can be a weapon, right? I mean, a hammer can, you know, be used to put nails down or it can be used to hit somebody over the head. So it's how you use the tool. You're right there. Uh, so first off, thanks for coming down and talking to us. It's been really interesting listening to what you got to say. Hey, man. Yeah. But... What I was thinking is, you were talking earlier about the, a global project to eliminate human suffering and yeah. to exist in the euphoric MDMA state. Now, what I was wondering is, uh, do you not think that, to some extent, suffering and adversity are a necessary part of the human condition and the search for meaning? That, arguably, having things like bliss and euphoria and happiness might not even be possible without the angst and the depression and the suffering to counterpoint that with? That's a fantastic question and I'm actually I'm actually inclined to agree with you I had an insight the other day my friend he's super excited because he got a Tesla and he was we went to like a road where he could like accelerate a little bit to show me like the pickup it had and you know when he when he would hit it 
that initial feeling of acceleration is like a reverse dolly shot in a film. It's, you can liken it to the moment when a character is having a realization where his reality has shifted from one to another. So again, back to your notion of contrast. You know? The reverse dolly shot in the movie works because you're temporarily disjointed and disoriented as you move again from one perspective to another through the eyes of this character. Acceleration takes you from one speed to another. Once you reach a velocity, you don't feel the speed anymore, really. It's only during the acceleration, which is the shift from one to the other. So perhaps you are right. Perhaps ecstasy is more meaningful after having overcome adversity. No doubt. You know, that's why there's the thrill of the chase, and then there's the thrill of attaining what it is you were chasing. And then you have to start again, because once you get what you want, the game is over. So, but maybe these are things that we can build and design into our life projects, whether they happen in the flesh world or in virtual reality. You know, I still think we can eliminate the suffering of illness and the unnecessary suffering of people starving and that kind of suffering. I don't think that that's necessary to give our lives meaning. I think we can maybe inject artificial dramatic suffering, just like a good movie has conflict, um, but without having to have people dying of cancer or, or horrendous other painful diseases. Thank you very much, man. Cheers, man. Hi. Uh, Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so, upon everything that you said, uh, a thought part, I've had a thought and I want to hear yours. So, uh, upon all and evolution, I want to ask, what if whenever we feel awe, there's a part of our brain that lights up, and in the happenstance of the virtual reality, then it always got, gets turned on. Yeah, it always gets turned on. But So what I'm saying is, what would that, how would that affect evolution? So upon the over axis of the turning on of the awe that fuels overhead, then do you think that virtual reality would induce, would lead to an evolutional uh, turning off of our <coughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if what you're asking is this, but I think, are you saying that if we figure out a way with our tools and technologies, whether it's virtual reality or other strategies, to give ourselves experiences of awe on a more regular basis, if then that will, I guess over many, many, many generations, transform us because we are using the part of the brain that registers awe more often? Is that what you're asking? No. I think it might take a long time no. before we <laughs> No, it's not? No, okay, it's well, not. then I didn't understand your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so let me explain it first. So upon your thinking process, I've had a thought that what if our, the part of our brain that fuels awe will always be turned on and <laughs> thus inducing the other parts of our head ev evolving into a smaller form? So the other parts of our brain would atrophy because we're not using yeah. them as much? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it would have to be many, 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 many generations before uh, our brain showed like some physiological change due to more exposure to awe. But so I'm not do a, you think I, that... I'm not a scientist, so I, I can't explain that as accurately as I would like. Oh. Mm -hmm. But thank you for your question. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have an answer to that? Well, the baseline going up, and yeah. then what happens after but that? that? I, but that baseline would have to be engineered to yeah. be different. That's yeah. different than just evolution having it, selecting for a different baseline. You know, David Pierce advocates intervening, like going in there and changing shit. So, yeah. Anyway. Hi, Jason. Hey. I understand that you're from Venezuela. Yeah. I want to get your opinion on the current state there. How things are going? Ah, great question. Um, Damn. What's your opinion? <laughs> Mine, no. 
for those that don't know, like Venezuela is collapsing. Um, it's basically a failed state. Inflation is like at a million percent this year. Um, the government is uh, basically a narco state. Um, they've censored all the media. They've arrested all political dissidents. They've rigged the elections. Um, they've turned down humanitarian assistance for the people who are starving and can't get access to medicine. But they wear this banner of fighting for some like Cuban-style socialist dream with no freedom for citizens, of course. And they've basically pillaged and, and raped the country, the most corrupt government in the history of the country. Um, and so being from there and you know seeing firsthand what has happened, uh, I think that we need a bunch of nations to get together and send armies in, bro. Thank you. Yeah. How would you say that the sort of Internet of Things and the extension of our mind in VR has affected culture and the way that we sort of interact with each other? Wait, say that again? How would you sort of say that the Internet and the extension of our own collective minds into a digital space has actually affected our interactions with one another, not purely on a digital realm? So you're saying that because we spend so much of our time interfacing with screens, how has that affected how we interface with each other? Yeah. I think it can be argued both ways. You know, I think people love to say, oh, we never pay attention to what's in front of us because we're always on our phone, but nobody ever stops to ask if maybe what's on our phone is more interesting than what's in front of us a large amount of the time. You could be onto something that no one else is. You know, example, yeah. you know like, I mean, sometimes you are watching an astounding video on YouTube in your uncomfortable commute in the subway in New York in the heat to work, and rather than staring at other miserable, angry folks, <laughs> you'd rather watch an, an amazing video to take you out of your head to make the commute a little bit less miserable, and that's an example of like, hell yeah, give me some escape. But maybe other examples is like, you know, you're at a park by yourself, you know, and there's a lovely lady there with her dog by herself, and you don't notice each other because you're both on your phone. Oh, well, that sucks too, you know. So it can be argued, <laughs> it can be argued both ways, man. See, it's hard for me to pick a side because I think it's all contextual. You know, there are some ways, you know, I, I owe you all being inspired by my work is thanks to this, you know. But the problem with this is also when this comes at the expense of not leaving room for face-to-face -face moments that are meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, I think it just, it just puts the responsibility back in our shoulders, I think, to self-curate how we deploy these tools. You know? mm -hmm. and that's, you. that's okay for now. Hi, Jason. Hey. Um, I was uh, impressed by the early discussion about uh, romance. Ah. And, well, I don't know. I just wanted to thank you for that uh, human moment um, uh, partway through where you were talking about, like, yeah, there's the, there's the pain and the agony of it, and sort of part of it is the meaning, and it's all intertwined. But... Um, yeah, I mean, even, even before you ask your question, you say to that, because, you know, I, this is something that I used to do a lot. I haven't done it as much anymore, and maybe because I've lost my tolerance for pain. But when I was, I've made videos all my life. I really have. You know, now I make videos of love, and I put some stock footage of generic humans that aren't directly related to me. But I used to basically make those same videos, and then the cutaways were to my girlfriend. <laughs> you know, and when I was deeply, deeply, deeply in love, that was intertwined with obsessive documentation. I was constantly recording what it was like to be in that intersubjective space. And then I was looking for words to describe that ecstasy. And I would take that footage and then I would edit it with the most heart-wrenchingly, agonizingly sad and beautiful melody I could find and lay that underneath and then review the footage even from the day before of me and this girl I was in love with, right? And what was amazing is within two seconds, something that was 24 hours ago was made so poignant. I was like, 
I felt like I had lost this person even though they were still in my life. And it was in mimicking the feeling of loss that it made me appreciate them more before I lost them. So in a way, it was like jolting myself into realizing how special it is to be in love with somebody. And it required an aesthetic act to bring attention to it. I needed to make the video. I needed to put it to sad music. You guys ever see the movie La La Land? The end montage of La La Land, the dream ballet that replays the whole movie with beautiful music and all the images is what could have been, what should have been, what might have been. That poignant Mm. feeling of looking back, that melancholic sadness, and it shatters you. And the reason it shatters you is because it makes you realize how much you didn't fully appreciate what you had. And I think that that's always been the tension and the dance that I've had with love. It's like I've created artificial suffering as a way of making me more present and appreciative of what I had. Yes, you know, and, and it's, maybe it's because my intuition knew that nothing lasts forever. And I was like, well, I'd rather grieve while I still have them because then I can actually hug them mm-hmm. in the midst of that sad ecstasy mm-hmm. rather than wait until they're actually gone and cry by myself. You know, that's weird shit I've been doing, but that's <laughs> what I would do. You know? That's what I would do. And I haven't even gotten to my question. Go. <laughs> <laughs> well, um... I was struck by what you were saying with regard to uh, having several solutions to the problem of death, um, to putting away the anxiety and the discomfort that comes with the notion that you will eventually die, and much that you care about as well. And um, religion being one solution, uh, love being another solution, and creative pursuits being a third solution, Mm -hmm, or the mm -hmm. pursuit of flow in Mm -hmm. particular. Mm -hmm. Um, And I mean, you, when you describe flow and you describe creative pursuits and creative states, you use much of the same language that you might use to describe romance, much of the same intensity, much of the same awe. And uh, the kind of question I have is basically that in noting that it's clearly the case that uh, you can't sustain the second solution um, for you know, one's entire life or even just more than 12 months, you know, it's uh, essentially insensible to um, to rely on that but maybe you can you can use the similarity between these things and and it's like the the sustainability of creative ecstasy is something you can repeatedly call it into being right Correct. it's not something that our tendency to be awed by creative experience doesn't just diminish after three months no it goes in cycles you can always get it back you just need a recovery phase you know after deep 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 flow it might take like a day or two where i just need to, to chill yeah. but the flow cycles yeah as long as you follow the rules of the cycle cycle and you pay attention to your biochemistry potentially yeah you could have flow until you die you know but in the cycles you know just not on the high the whole time Go on. Right, <laughs> which makes it a, a particularly powerful third solution. Yes, um, correct. And maybe correct. my question is, what is your opinion on uh, pursuing a kind of synthesis uh, of Love and flow? repeatedly engaging in creative pursuits um, mutualist, like in a mutual relationship with other people as a way to sustain? So you've mm-hmm. just provided the Not ultimate the solution. Face, necessarily. <laughs> no, no, no. See, what you've said right now, like, I just got the goosebumps because it's, you know, I think the, the whole thing in life, as far as mental health is concerned, is DIY, right? Like, we're all fucking trying to figure it out. And the jazz musician has a solution. The basketball player has a solution. The surfer has a solution. I mean, they're all the bodhisattvas telling you, this is the way, my son. Learn how to surf this wave. Learn how to box. Get a workout in. Like, everybody's promising you the, 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 the thing, the flow, the high, the awe. Mm. But there are certain things that tend to constantly trigger it. Well, no matter what type of flow, is, what activity specifically gets you the flow, there's a universal flow trigger, which is novelty. So a new experience tends to put you into flow, even if you hadn't decided if that's your activity that you love doing. But, a, but the fact that it's new will probably be a flow trigger. So I have always thought if you combine, let's say, travel with a relationship, you could probably renew the excitement of meeting them for the first time by changing the backdrop. Instead of having to change the person, you change the <laughs> backdrop and the person comes into view again because of the flow induced by travel. And then if you want to even be more DIY, well, you know, then 
you know, you add a little bit of an intoxicant here and there to italicize the experience, you know, some Sounds wine like you're or we're in California, a, some cannabis. Say again? Sounds like you're offering an enticing uh, opportunity for the next contender. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I've you said know, that the next time I get into a serious to. relationship, it's going to be like, oh, my God, we have to go travel the world. I mean, hasn't that always been the dream? Don't you want to like see a sunset like sitting on a sailboat in some like remote island, like the halo of the now, dude, the sacred timeless moment, the moment that exists outside of time, right? Golden hour veneer. Yeah, dude. Thank you. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, so I thought it opened with a little quote that's always moved me. Uh, it's by William Shakespeare. It says, uh, if music be the food of love, play on. Um, Say it again. If music be the food of love, play on. Oof. Yeah, I feel that too. Mm -hmm. um, wow. So I was had a similar question to him about, you seem like you go into these relationships thinking they're going to end, or that they have an end, and you haven't maybe found like that person where you feel like it's that forever. And how... Would you imagine creating with that person? You know, two is not really stable, whereas that third, um, that gives stability. And normally you co-create, which is typically a baby. Um, mm. But what if it were like a project, a you know, passion project together? And yeah. that would be the glue. Um, yeah, well, I think in, in some ways, I would say that that, sort of assumption or that relationship with endings and finitude is is something that people come to terms with at different times in their lives you know some people maybe don't experience it until they're on their deathbed and lucky them they lived in the present the whole time they never worried that things were going to end until they fully ended but still they had a lot of bliss throughout um i think that your expectations and your assumptions about finitude are determined by early childhood experiences right because when you're a child, you live in the Garden of Eden. When you're a child, you live outside of time. That's kind of what's wonderful about ch the childlike consciousness. And, you know, I remember my mom told me this story that, uh, you know, we lived in Venezuela, so when we would go to the U.S. like twice a year, one of the exciting things about going to the U.S. is you go to the toy store. You know, they didn't have toy stores like that in Venezuela, like Toys R Us and shit. <laughs> and, uh, and so, but maybe because... I was lear I learned from a young age that you know we only go to the U.S. twice a year, and then therefore we're only there for a short amount of time before we go back to Venezuela, and so there's only a certain amount of days that you can go to the toy store. So I'd go to the toy store, and I used to get anxiety going in because I was so overwhelmed by all the options. And I'd go back to my mom and be like, "Can we stay here infinite time?" Because I already had like a relationship with the tension that like I couldn't be there indefinitely, and you know that clearly stems from something in my childhood. I don't know if it was the like early divorce of my parents, you know, or just an acutely sensitive kid that asked too many questions about the way of things. But certainly there was a realization, a shattering of the Garden of Eden early on. And, 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 and I think it has to do also with feeling unsafe at an early age, right? Because when you're young, you're supposed to be made to feel completely protected which is the illusion of eternity. Your parents are gods and goddesses. You live outside of time. They're omnipotent, and you live in a gated paradise You know that keeps the chaos at bay. But any type of illness at an early age of a parent or a divorce or anything that shatters that important illusion <laughs> to make you a well-adjusted person with low levels of neuroticism, if that is shattered, that's the beginning of pathology. You know, it's... it's, it's it's the waking up into hell, so to speak. Um, and then you spend the rest of your life trying to recapture that feeling of feeling safe and feeling held and feeling protected. And it's like, what drug, what trip, what person, what piece of art can return me to that feeling? You know? So it's like, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't be who I am and done the work that I have done, I guess, if things would have been different. But it's also meant a lot of a lot of trials and tribulations along the way, you know. Gracias. Eh, y también habla español, entonces. Ah, qué maravilla. Pienso que eh, el acceso al flow viene diferente cuando uno habla en el idioma eh, principio. That's eh, also true. She's saying that flow is easier in your native tongue. Eh, y también estoy, tengo 
varias preguntas, pero todavía hay mucha gente. Eh, estoy curiosa si has tomado la experiencia de ayahuasca en ceremonia. I have <laughs> they heard ayahuasca, they got excited. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to answer that. The, the, well, the short answer is I have not drank ayahuasca. I know that it's become very trendy as of late. Um, Carl Jung has a great line about entheogenics, and which is why I think that the highly controlled uh, way in which they're doing it in these trials with psilocybin and stuff are the way to go. He says, beware of unearned wisdom. Okay, and, and Jordan Peterson quoted Carl Jung when asked the same question. Beware of unearned wisdom because you might, be, you might not be a vessel that can handle that divine fluid. It's like the Ark of the Covenant, right? Yeah, God is in there, but if you look at it, you die, you know? So I just think that is there healing to be found in plant medicine? No doubt. That's why civilizations for millennia have employed these tools. But they also had very fixed containers for them. And I think people getting together in a Brooklyn apartment with some shaman tourist they brought from Brazil who's giving everybody... I, don't, I just don't know if that ticks the boxes of a safe container. And I worry about the irresponsible use Because I think in the desire to heal trauma, these medicines can also cause trauma. And, uh, and so even though I'm pro-research 100%, I am not pro-casual when it comes to this stuff. Gracias. Hi. Hi. How are you? So much. Thank you. I kind of don't even know where to begin. Oh, um, good. But I guess in the interest of keeping it short and focusing on suffrage and fully coming well-rounded with plant medicine, discussing ayahuasca, relationship to self, intrinsic behavior, how your body responds, responds what's going on from the outside. Speaking about Michael Pollan um, and food and the interest of AI and what the goal is. I mean, they're looking at AI now for treatment, for pain because we're not understanding where pain is actually coming from but we understand that if we're in AI or if we're in psychedelics then we're going to be developing neural pathways we're going to be training our body we're going to be creating this delicious response hence through structure and guidance that we can find some tangible traction to ease the suffrage hence suffrage I'm a huge plant-based person And I'm very interested in the human relationship to toxin, toxin development, calcification of the penile gland, the lack of acknowledgement to the psoas muscle, which is our intrinsic response to fright and flight and terror. So if the glass is going to fall, my psoas is telling me, first, catch the glass. But nobody's paying attention to the psoas muscle, and it continues mm -hmm. to go away. Now, I get this isn't the context and the space to do it, and I'm really excited about AI. I get to be at TechCrunch this year in San Francisco for some mm -hmm. crazy stuff. It's just like part of the future. Mm -hmm. At the exact same time, we have to pay attention to our food. We have to pay attention to what is causing our system to sleep and to be quiet, to meet the need of AI. Yeah. When our body is in suffrage, when we eat the food that we are given to eat, the first place of suffrage we have is asphyxiation. You like movies. I get it. Forgive me because I'm on the mic. They have the goblet. You take the cyanide. No, you take the cyanide. No, who's going to die first? Oh, guess what? We both have it. I've just been building up my body's protection to this. So in the relationship to toxicity in food, how do we find access to this when most of this stuff causes our body to sleep, causes us to be debilitated? It causes the disease, the cancer, and the pain on top of the emotional aspect of why do people have breast cancer? Well, most women have breast cancer because, hi, we bear the burden of the world, and we have these two nectars <laughs> that provide and it encases our heart. Hmm. Well, our heart is breaking, our heart can't handle it. So it moves the energy from your heart, it puts it to your breast, 
where it can be disseminated, where it actually gets touched, where it actually gets acknowledgement, where mm. it actually gets all of. So yeah. in short, I don't know if there's a question, but she... <laughs> I think, no, I think, thank you for sharing. Yeah, but you no, get, I, I think... like, because it is all intrinsic and connected and we want to be connected and we want to sit with the medicine plant but you can't sit with plant and toxin right so yeah let's have people work out a way that we can have these things to support this but if we're supporting it through the dissemination of toxins which is going to stagnate our liver which is going to mess up our kidneys which is going to screw our adrenals which is going to make women have thyroid problems crazy with a lack of sleep like i know you know <laughs> so what you got bruh come to Oakland no I'm kidding <laughs> thank you you're welcome hi Jason um, my name is Marcel I'm from Brazil hey man I'd like to ask you a more sober question it's a little bit off topic in what was discussed here but I really would like to hear your thoughts in regards to the duality that now we have so much access to material things. And I think most of all of us here in this room would say they're living a comfortable life compared to others. And I think San Francisco is the perfect example of this duality. How do you feel? Um, I, I'd just love to hear your thoughts in regards to this perspective that we're constantly looking for success, trying to reach our best and have those happiness moments. Um, working on these companies, you know, driving these cars and, and doing all this stuff, while at the same time seeing so much poverty, so much people needing our help, and at the same time having to suffocate that inner soul that screams, help this guy in the street, right? And I'll say, I'm, I'm a hypocrite. I, I, I'll say that we right now. Yeah. But I mean, what do you feel about having to suffocate those feelings in our soul to help those people at the same time feeling so... Um, not empowered to do anything because that's just a big problem on a bigger scale. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think it, the feeling is one of total impotence and it's a, uh, I think that empathy rarely extends beyond our line of sight. So I think the solution for most people is just not to look there, mm -hmm. whether consciously or unconsciously. Um, another coping strategy, even though it's true, but it's still a coping strategy, is to tell yourself the world is better than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're suffering, but there's a lot less than there used to be, and hundreds of millions of people leave poverty every day. It's just maybe not happening at the rate in America, but certainly in Southeast Asia and other places, people are leaving poverty at a rapid, rapid, rapid rate. It's just we don't live there, we don't see it. Mm -hmm. But all in all, human progress is astounding by every measurable indicator. So, you know, you walk down the street, you see a homeless person, you're like, how is it possible? This is so horrible. This is so sad. You feel impotent. Maybe you tell yourself that. Like, yeah. overall, things are getting better. Certainly doesn't help that person, but it helps you to feel less guilty when yeah. you continue to walk and do your thing. Um, I think that's what people do, right? What else can they do? Unless you're going to say that you can help that one person, but then what about the 150 million that you're not helping? Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean... I suffer the same way with this as you. And every time I see a person that doesn't seem well, it feels like all of my concerns and ambitions and goals are called into question and seem meaningless. And, I, and you feel like a hypocrite. I mean, I, 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 I share with you that sensation. And, and I don't really have a solution. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I mean, I don't. I, I struggle with that yeah. daily. Yeah, I'm just saying that um, there's a... We have to wrap Q&A up. Okay. Yeah, we got to wrap Q&A up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you.